this week's update. Emerging markets feel the force of dollar strength. Oil is pushed higher as Trump targets Iran and the Bank of England rose back on monetary tightening. There are two big market stories this week, the dollar and oil. The first of these, the dollar, is being expressed via emerging markets, where currencies, bonds and equities in the developing world have come under increasing pressure from an unexpected surge in the US currency. The link between events in the developed world, the US in particular, and emerging markets is not new. Back in the 1990s, faster than forecast interest rate hikes in America triggered a Mexican peso crisis, which spread to other developing markets. In 2013, the so-called taper tantrum caused problems in emerging markets, and more recently, the election of Donald Trump in November 2016 caused worries, which briefly looked unfounded, but now seem to be bearing fruit. The challenge markets expected from a Trump administration are only now emerging. His campaign was all about tax cuts and higher spending, which investors rightly thought would lead to higher interest rates, a rising dollar and problems for emerging market borrowers with debts denominated in the US currency. For most of 2017, that scenario was kept at bay. The spending plans and tax cuts proved difficult to get through Congress, while the dollar was kept in check by unexpected economic strength in Europe. Emerging markets benefited. That benign backdrop has evaporated in re recent weeks, however, as the gap between interest rate expectations in America and in the rest of the world has widened. The big tax cuts agreed before Christmas have emboldened the Federal Reserve to push ahead with its tightening program, while the rest of the world has reined in expectations of rate hikes. The result? The euro has fallen below $1.20, while the pound is back to $1.35. That's a bad environment for emerging markets, but it's not the only problem in the developing world. Argentina is in the headlines this week after raising its interest rate to 40% in a bid to prop up the peso. When that failed, the country tapped the International Monetary Fund for a line of credit to shore up its finances. In Turkey, the lira is also under pressure as investors raise concerns about the country's increasingly autocratic government. Brazil and Mexico have elections in the offing, causing uncertainty in those countries. Now, it's far too early to signal an emerging market crisis just yet, even if Argentina does seem to have lost control of its currency and will have to accept another painful devaluation. The US interest rate tightening program has been well flagged, so investors should have largely priced it in. Also, the developing world is in better shape than prior to earlier crises. Countries there are less dependent on dollar-denominated debt than they were, although this has been rising of late. The trouble is that international financial flows are less concerned about the fundamentals on the ground in the emerging world than they are by the secure income that can be achieved in the US when rates rise more quickly there than in the rest of the world. The fate of emerging markets lies with Jay Powell at the Fed. The other big market story is oil, where the cost of crude has risen to a four-year high of around $75 on a range of issues. Rising demand in a recovering global economy, the success of production curbs by OPEC and Russia to offset rising shale output, and this week concerns about the reimposition of sanctions on Iran and the potential for an intensification of Middle East tensions. Last night, President Trump delivered on his promise to withdraw America from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. That's a multinational deal put in place by the Obama administration that saw Iran gain relief from international sanctions in return for mothballing its nuclear program. Donald Trump has always criticised the deal, which he's called the worst ever. And yesterday, he ignored the pleas of other participants like French President Macron by pulling out. Iran now joins the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Global Paris Agreement on Climate Change in the long list of Obama initiatives that Trump has jettisoned. The oil market has already factored in disruption of supplies via new sanctions, but also heightened tensions in the Middle East if Iran goes back to building nuclear weapons and ratchets up its hostility towards Saudi Arabia and Israel. An arms race in the region is the last thing the world needs against a backdrop of rising tensions in Syria and Yemen. The question is how much further the oil price could go before it starts to have a negative impact on global growth. It's already more than doubled from its low point below $30 a barrel in early 2016, 
but it remains well shy of the $100 mark from which it tumbled in 2014. The US claims to be putting in place agreements with other producers, most obviously Saudi Arabia, to increase production to make up for any shortfall in Iran, which exports around 2.5 million barrels of crude a day. Any sanctions would not kick in immediately either, so there is still time for diplomacy to do its work. But at the margin, the developments of the past 24 hours are oil price positive and global economy negative. The health of that global economy, for which the oil price is a key input, was in focus on Friday, as America's non-farm payrolls emerged a bit weaker than expected, with 164,000 new jobs created in April. That didn't stop the jobless rate falling to an 18-year low of 3.9%, but average hourly earnings were unchanged at 2.6%, again slightly below expectations. The mixed picture in the US may have given the Federal Reserve pause for thought earlier in the week when it left interest rates unchanged, but there's little reason to think that there will not be another hike in June and perhaps two more this year. Inflation rose to 1.9% in America last week, suggesting that the Fed will remain on track to progressively tighten policy over the next couple of years. Perhaps the one thing that could derail that program is an intensification of the nascent trade war between the US and China. The US has set out a series of demands on the trade deficit and other issues that China is certain to disregard. The temperature is rising on global trade. Now, the certainty at the Fed is notably absent in the UK, which sees the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee meeting this week. Until a few weeks ago, a further quarter point rate hike looked almost guaranteed. In fact, the implied probability in the futures markets was over 90%. But after some hasty backpedalling by Governor Mark Carney in the wake of very weak GDP growth figures for the first quarter of 2018, a rate rise now seems completely improbable. The response in the currency market has been dramatic, having reached $1.45 recently, that was close to the level before the EU referendum nearly two years ago, the pound has fallen back to $1.35. Investors are now assuming that UK interest rates will remain lower for longer, and alongside growing Brexit uncertainty, the incentive to own UK assets is dwindling. On Brexit, a key meeting of the UK Cabinet this week will indicate whether Prime Minister Theresa May is prepared to face down her staunchly pro-Brexit colleagues over the UK's future participation in a customs union. Now, whether Britain is inside or out of Europe's tariff-free zone, the customs union has become a major sticking point in the Brexit negotiations. Being in would give the UK borderless trade in goods with a huge market on our doorstep, but it would come at the cost of not being able to sign other bilateral trade deals with countries elsewhere. A further complication is that not being in some sort of customs union probably necessitates the reimposition of a hard border in Ireland, something that no one wants and which the government has committed to avoid. So on the corporate front, attention continues to be focused on first quarter earnings announcements as investors question whether profits growth is strong enough to justify current stock market valuations. With about 80% of the US results announcements now in, the average growth rate has been a pretty stunning 24% or so. That's better even than already high market expectations. And 78% of companies have managed to beat analyst forecasts. That's the best ratio since 2008. Unfortunately, the market has barely budged on the good news. The S&P 500 is up less than 1% since earnings season started, showing just how vulnerable investors are to any disappointment going forwards. Indeed, there have been some notable share price slides, even after good results. Caterpillar is a good example. It beat estimates for sales and profits and increased its full year estimate. But investors were more focused on the company's warning that the first three months of the year would represent high watermark for the current cycle. The fear is that 10 years into an economic and market upswing, things just can't get any better. On this side of the pond, finally, two big companies with different sets of problems will be reporting. BT has seen its shares halve in the past couple of years, its battle with a profits warning, accounting scandal, a record fine from the UK's regulator. 
It remains in a battle with Ofcom over the amount it charges rivals to use its broadband network, and it's in tough negotiations with the unions too over its pension scheme. Plenty of questions, in other words, to answer on Thursday. And meanwhile, William Morrison, the UK's fourth largest supermarket, will announce its results against a fast-changing UK food retail backdrop. Last week, it heard that its two bigger rivals, Sainsbury's and Asda, are in talks about a merger that would leave it a very distant third behind the market leader Tesco and Sazda or Asbury's, as the new kid on the block has been temporarily named. Thank you.